Hello, Working Preachers. Our fall fundraising campaign has officially come to a close, and the entire Sermon Brainwave team wanted to take this opportunity to extend our gratitude for each and every one of you. Thanks to your partnership and your generosity in October, we were able to exceed our fundraising goal, which means we unlocked the $10,000 matching gift. This ministry would not be possible without our generous donors like you. So thank you so much for your powerful testimony that biblical preaching matters. Your financial gift to this ministry are reminders that Christ Church is always in action in places known and unknown. Thank you again for making our fall fundraising campaign a major success. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is the podcast for the 26th Sunday after Pentecost on November 17th, 2024. The first reading in the complimentary series is Daniel 12, 1 through 3. The first reading in the semi-continuous series is 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 20. We'll talk about Psalm 16. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 25, although 15 through 18 are optional. And then from the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, our last Mark and text before Reign of Christ Sunday next week. But Mark's getting us ready for it with a little, uh, little apocalyptic rattling of the cages here in chapter 13. Yeah. Which will help for indeed. Christ the King or Reign of Christ. And that will help for Advent 1. Exciting stuff. Well, mm -hmm. thus, thus endeth quite a few things. Mark, <laughs> the year of Mark, the uh, our season of the semi-continuous reading, and our reading through Hebrews. You made so it. So far farewell, farewell, yeah. and Godspeed to y'all. All right. But what do we do with Mark 13? Mm. Well, we... We began the year in Mark 13, we might recall. So, uh, as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, I think these are the weeks that you go back and think about what have I said about Mark? What have we talked about? What themes have I lifted up? But the, but the very first reading of Mark in Advent 1 is from chapter 13. It's, typical, it's always that apocalyptic section of the Gospels. And so take people back to that and say, here we are. Here we are again. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which actually an apocalyptic text or an apocalyptic vision surrounds this year, surrounds yeah. year B. Uh, and as a as a liturgical season, not that you want to go full blown. Maybe you don't want to go full blown apocalyptic on people. That might not make for the best sermon, but it's an interesting idea, particularly if you throw in a little Daniel, and and get people to think about, uh, and get people to think about what difference does it make that that uh, part of what is cast in Mark is this kind of, um, it is an, an, an apocalyptic idea of mm -hmm. what, the, what the reign of God looks like or the kingdom of God looks like. So first thing. It's, um, it's key to make sure people know that Jesus isn't making this up whole cloth, that he's already got a form to follow. And Daniel's helpful to see that. Jesus is mm -hmm. not speaking in a way that nobody's ever heard before. And there's something very stock and recognizable about what he says, starting in, you know, verse five and forward. But that doesn't mean it's generic or disconnected or that its purpose is just to, you know, frighten people with unspecific things, that this is in some ways addressing, I believe, the the destruction of Jerusalem, either Jesus predicting it or Mark looking back at it or Mark reading in the midst of it or something, which is uh, terrifying. And so to, just like Daniel is writing in the midst of an awful persecution by Antiochus Epiphanes, Jesus is writing about or speaking about, Mark's writing about, we can talk more about that, Roman decimation coming to Judea and leveling everything in its path, path and everyone in its path. 
and it's going to take down the temple, which um, if you've seen what beautiful stones and what large buildings, it's massive. Yeah. And the idea of that being torn down sounds ridiculous. And so just to kind of help people get a sense for that, this the connection between this text and the Great Revolt mm-hmm. and the significance of that, mm-hmm. uh, Josephus, the historian, is probably exaggerating, but he says a million Jews in Judea died during this revolt, which is also a civil war mm-hmm. between Judean Jews and their neighbors and families. That So, you know, to like not make this think like, oh, that's weird, that's quaint, but this is language that tries to deal with the question, how could this be happening? What's going on? Where is God? What do we have to hope for? That this is a kind of prelude to that. I don't know if that preaches easily, but I think you have to at least help people get more deeply into that, which makes the Bible appear maybe a little bit less science fiction-y or or panicky or something like that. Do you know what I mean? I think a sermon's got to do that instruction, I would say, is that's my, what did you say, Caroline? First impressions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's important to read this in the context, in the historical context in which it is written, as well as the literary context, which you two have just both pointed out. Um, because so often this text is used in a prophetic voice of what's about to happen, ignoring the fact that for uh, the first century readers, uh, the first century, uh, the early church, this would have been an account of what has happened. And um, there's a familiarity. You've heard me talk about the first chapter of Isaiah sounding like, you know, somebody's just um, put that in the contemporary news media teleprompters. Um, There is a truthfulness that seems contemporary in these words, but we have this text as a reminder of God's presence, um, of, of who God is, and that God is with us. So, Matt, you raised the question, where is God in the midst of this? That's For some folks, that's exactly the question we're asking right now. But we gather together to rehearse this story, to remind us that we aren't the first to feel this, we aren't the first to articulate this, And we gather together in this name because God is with us. Where he begins is with warnings about deception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Warnings about liars, Mm -hmm. warnings about false claims Mm -hmm. to truth, Mm -hmm. warnings about people who are going to take advantage of the chaos and try to make it worse. Mm -hmm. And because when the chaos strikes, whatever that looks like, whether it's natural disaster, political warfare, whatever, economic. Uh, People are going to wonder, where is God? People are going to start to grasp at things. Uh, This doesn't just even happen with national calamities. This happens in institutions that are struggling. Mm -hmm. People will start grasping at things without stopping to say, is that really true? Is that really Jesus? Is that really who we are? Uh, so I love that he starts with that. I don't think it's so much he's saying, like, look out for the Antichrist who's coming. I don't think that's what's going on here in Mark at all. But mm-hmm. it is a warning that deception is one of the biggest um, pitfalls that people of mm-hmm. faith might fall into when times get tough. No, that, yeah, that's the, what I was going to point toward. Uh, beware that no one leads you astray uh, and those false leaders or those false claims. And so in that regard, it, the, the presence of, of this little, you know, the, the mini apocalypse uh, Mm -hmm. that we get in Mark as a, as an end toward our year in Mark, it, it becomes another way to say, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. What, what, what are you holding on as your perspective? What are you are you reading this through the you know through the lens of Jesus ministry uh, and then that and then you're holding on to what is true or uh, or are you being you know led astray from that truth to uh, to false claims and so I think it I think to not not only to 
tie it into a, a particular, you know, the particular historical situation, and then also, uh, it, and also what Jesus is, um, Jesus is saying, particularly to his, to his disciples. And of course, this is right. This is right before the final section of the gospel and the, of, of what's, you know, what's going to play out. Uh, but also within the context of what Mark has been setting up, what Mark set up from the very beginning, that, that, you know, being able to, being able to recognize or see the kingdom of God takes some interpretive activity. And it, it also, uh, what you want the it's kingdom of God to look like, which I think is in part expressed with the with the disciples, what great buildings, what large stones, is is also the the what that leads you astray, and uh, so lots of I think lots of really important things here to help people uh, imagine, and then also as you said to set up to set up Christ the King and and Christ's reign, but also to set up Advent. Mm-hmm. It's a really mm-hmm. great text to set up Advent in Absolutely. terms of you know the waiting of, uh, for Jesus. And so how are we, how are we reading and interpreting the signs of that, um, of that waiting? The, if you preached or used, uh, the Psalm last week, um, in what have you put your trust down in princes and horses, um, not in, you know, great buildings, um, that you're, you're, you've led yourself appropriately into getting into this text also. Um, and as you said, Caroline, and then allowing this to become the stepping stone for Christ the King, King Sunday. Again, tying everything that we've been preaching together through the end of the year to turn it to the beginning of the year where once again we begin to tell the story of the presence of Jesus incarnate among us, whose life we get to emulate. Um, are we telling this story for one where we have power over, and we say we're going to do that in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, then we might be being deceitful. But if we're telling this story in the hopefulness that God shows up, and that God is with us, that's an entirely different tone for reading this text. I'm going to suggest we add some verses. Oh, cool. what verses would you add? Uh, at least 9 and 10. You could do the whole paragraph, but at least 9 and 10. I'm stealing this from my teacher, Brian Blunt, who uh, focuses a lot of attention on verse 10 when he talks about this passage, that in the midst of this chaos, at a time when Jesus becomes difficult to find because of all of the chaos and the deception, and I don't mean some future calamity. I mean, at any time there's chaos and there's right. the church has a hard time finding its way, that verses 9 and 10 reorient us, one about giving testimony, and then the second one in verse 10, where the good news must first be preached to all the nations, that in the midst of all of this, the church is consistent calling or task remains to bear witness. So you can make a similar claim about the book of Revelation as well. Though the stakes are a little bit higher, perhaps in that book. But this is how the church finds its way, is by never giving up on its call to bear witness to who it knows Jesus to be. And that doesn't necessarily just mean like reciting the Apostles' Creed, of course, right? That's living the way he lived throughout this gospel right. uh, up to this point, and, and who he cares about, and who he calls to account, and where he where he takes sides or with whom he takes sides and that that reference that reference to the good news really does take you back to the first chapter of mark there you go yes um, yeah well, what about daniel chapter 12 uh, another one of those I, apocalyptic texts yeah, yeah but i think it's so daniel is i i think i would i think well i don't think i would preach daniel on its own i I think I would try to use it in as a way to help people get a sense of what apocalyptic what? does and and its functions and yeah somebody like somebody might want to just tackle Daniel in one fell swoop and all right knock yourself out if you preach it on its own <laughs> you've got to spend a lot of time with verse two and three where we've got what might be the first 
at least in the Bible, and checks in the Bible, first reference, clear reference to an afterlife yeah. and judgment afterlife, and yeah. reward mm -hmm. and punishment mm -hmm. in Jewish writings and Jewish scriptures. Yeah. Which, you know, I like because I'm into that kind of stuff, but I realize that's kind of nerdy. But if you're not doing that, then I think you at least have to talk about the ways in which crisis, crisis moments prompted this kind of theology in Israel's history, in Jesus' own conception of who he is, what he'd come to do, what time he lives in. Not that that's the only right way to interpret chaotic moments, but to say that's deeply imprinted on so much of our Christian vocabulary and our, and our ways of being, and to think about how we find our way in that and how we sometimes get lost in that kind of language and speculation. But that's, for me, that's more a sermon on Mark that jumps yeah. over and glances at Daniel from time to time. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm in agreement with you. There's so much work that would need to be done to actually put Daniel in its interpretive context um, that I think using it uh, as a scripture to understand scripture is is the way to go, mm -hmm. especially if mm -hmm. you, especially as we conclude uh, this year of Mark. And also putting it in its time, putting both of these passages in its time. This is not a prediction. It's a record. It's a reminder and it's a caution. And um, to convey it in that way, it's faithful to the text. And that's why you have to get behind the text to understand the context in which it's written. Uh, to, to pull it out and to use it is, well, it's more than dangerous. <laughs> And I think if that were the case, that's where I would pull in the psalm as well. That you have here, you have uh, here you have the psalmist of absolute com confidence in the presence of God and the protection of God and the refuge mm -hmm. of God and and uh, and uh, no matter no matter what. And so you have I, my body also rests secure you show me the path of life and so i i think that the confidence of the psalmist which is in part what apocalyptic literature does too i mean it yeah. it names its name names the control of god in the midst of chaos could be a that's what i would do with the psalm what that's is it that psalm. if you really want to understand yeah. a person's philosophy is you listen to the songs they listen um, in mm, times mm -hmm. of celebration and in times of sorrow. Yeah, yeah. And listen to their poetry, yeah. I like that. I, yeah, I would take time to commend the psalm in some way to people as, mm -hmm. a, as a worship leader. Um, I read it this time and I thought, why have I never memorized this? Like, I know the yeah, 23rd good, Psalm, 23rd yeah. Psalm shorter, but this I, one's worth memorizing. This is one I would like to know I when pretty I'm in much, a scary moment. I pretty much say that about all of scripture. Why have I not memorized it? Yeah. Why have I not? Especially, passage, especially, I especially really... the good passages, but I don't, I mean, I don't know that I- This I've, is totally, like... totally random, but I once met a woman, gosh, it's been about 20 years uh, ago now. She was, um, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s. And um, she had in her long life, forgotten more passages of scripture than I've bothered to memorize. <laughs> she had nearly memorized the entire Bible and was, you know, stumbling over verse. And I'm like, don't complain about stumbling. You have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And particularly the Psalms. But yeah, I agree with you, Matt. This would be one. I might just take you up on that one and learn this one just because you challenged I have to delete my me. Bible app off my phone. That'll motivate me, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now for something completely different here on Apocalyptic Sunday, number one, uh, for Samuel 1. Yeah, we could miss all of that dangerous talk. And, and talk and about tell Hannah. This, ta tell the story of Hannah. Yeah. Yeah. It's a totally different one, a, a, a different entry, um, this um, – Beginning of uh, what will be uh, the stories that will lead to the stories of the king. So after the time of judges, we're shifting. We're beginning to shift into that, um, and we have this beautiful story 
Uh, I, I just find humor in this story. I find uh, depth of emotion. Um, I find the normal um, uh, or maybe exaggerated miscommunication between uh, men and women. Um, and then it ends in this awesome faithfulness of God. Uh, this this is a, a powerful story. It's 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 one of my faves. Well, and, and I think that's maybe uh, I think that's an important p- potential angle into the story is that here you have uh, a, a, another a, another moment in Scripture of the witness of a woman, Hannah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and uh, and her role in in uh, God's you know God's God's overall relationship with God's people, and so I. Rather than try, I mean, it's the last semi-continuous. So, rather than necessarily going back or looking forward to next, what will it be June or <laughs> whatever when we have the when we pick up the semi-continuous again? Just preach it for its own yeah. its own testimony to uh, to Hannah and mm-hmm. and her story and opportunity to lift up another woman of of faith um, mm-hmm. that that we just don't get to hear much about though. That's that's a, that's what I would do. Mm-hmm. I was struck reading it this time by her prayer, and that she is. I don't, tell me, is is she bargaining with God? I mean, it sounds like bargaining, right? Like, if you do this, I mean, he's going to be a Nazarite. <laughs> mm. I'll set him before you until the day of his death. Um, you know, and of course, she then will hand him over mm-hmm. uh, to the temple. Doesn't mean she never sees him again or anything like that. But right. that she makes a sacrifice. A stunning one after his birth, mm-hmm. and I, there's something that's disturbing about the the bargaining. It'd be nice if God said, "Don't worry about it. You're going to have a child. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need any of this stuff." Um, but it, what struck me is, haven't we all tried it? Haven't we all bargained <laughs> with God? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just something familiar about what she does there. Like, I will do anything, even if it means. I don't know if she sees it as a loss, but I, don't, I would do anything um, for this to happen, which I sometimes think that faith is less about belief and more about just sheer desperation. It's mm. what do you do when you've got nowhere else to go? That's for God, that's enough faith, quote unquote faith. And I read this as a kind of trust, but also there is a sense of what more do you want from me? <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes for this to happen. Which is kind of right on that boundary line between beautiful and cruel. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily cruel in that God's being mean to her, but cruel in that she needs a break somewhere in her life, right? Because of the depth of the agony that she appears to feel. Am I making any sense at all? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. No, yeah, maybe that's I shouldn't true. Have said. Maybe that's yeah. how life feels. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I would I would point people to the commentary too that really does a good job of all the levels of what Hannah is going through. She's yeah. not just a, she's not just a story. <laughs> she's yeah, navigating, yeah, because, she's navigating uh, a lot on her own. Yeah. She's yeah, navigating inter- a lot on her own terms. Yeah. Um, with, so. with the other wives. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. This is mm-hmm. a, this is a moment of desperation. Like you said, Matt. Yeah. Well, and she's certainly not what Eli thinks she is, which is kind of the main <laughs> tension for me in the story. Um, True. and even Eli, who we learn later on is just a loser, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> uh, a bit of a snake or his sons, especially mm-hmm. even he seems to kind of push the thing in motion, right? May the God, may God grant this, you know, which is, and Eli would do something similar with Samuel too. When Samuel tells him that basically you're the, you're the first on the chopping block. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just interesting about how her faith is able to move even someone like Eli or or kind of dislodge some of the hardness of his own heart. Mm-hmm. Not to make the story about him, but hopefully I, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Significant background character. Yeah. Hey, this is our last week for some time in the book of Hebrews. How do you feel about that? Uh I think that I wish that's, we could hear what our people are saying out there. I think that's just fine. We've worked through Hebrews and we've got some 
themes here that we've already talked about. You get Mm -hmm. in verse 12, a single sacrifice, single offering he has perfected, right? Mm -hmm. And so these just claims over and over again of the singularity of of, of Christ's action. And I, I think then to put, I, I mean, this last part is really just quite beautiful. You know, since we have this great high priest that we've been talking about for all these chapters, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, uh, full conviction, firm persuasion. How is it that we're able to have full assurance of faith or full conviction or firm persuasion? It's because of the singular activity of Jesus uh, as the great high priest with our hearts sprinkled clean. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering and let us consider how to provoke one another to do love, to love and good deeds. And so you have that three point let us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that a salad? Not, not, not as an iceberg or romaine, <laughs> as I like to tell my students the lettuce, yeah, the lettuce sermons. But, mm-hmm. but that capacity to say we can, we can do this, is grounded in that promise that Hebrews, Hebrews has said over and over again. And I think you know, it might very well be that for someone or people out there in your congregation to be able to say you can approach the throne of grace with full assurance of faith and conviction of confession of hope. And, um, and what difference does that make? I, um, you, you, um, ended in 24 and, uh, now go ahead and, and mention 25 and, and, and throw it back to Matt. I don't know if you want to say more, uh, you said this, uh, I think it was last week, uh, that where we're going and where we now are uh, here in Hebrews is about discipleship. Um, and so, Caroline, as you just set up so well, because of who Jesus is, therefore, this is what we confess, therefore, in therefore, we meet together to rehearse what it is we believe, and in that habit, also do more than believe, but it changes our behavior. I don't know if you want to say more about that, Matt. I just thought that was a great idea. Yeah. I mean, just it's a book that's so theologically dense and a lot of people spend a lot of time on it trying to figure out the origins of Christology and things like that. It's all that's all good and helpful. But it is a it's a sermon. The book's a sermon, I think, that is trying to push people along out of complacency or people who are somehow stalled out in their, in their faith. And so early on, it talks about, you know, I'm going to, it's time to move away from milk and have some solid food. I'm going to tell you some stuff that's hard to figure out. You know, a lot of the book is a reflection on Psalm 110. And that's even here in in verse 12 cited again, that's coming. But at the end of the day, the whole purpose is about confidence, right? So verse 19, we have this confidence, right? Uh, Don't waver in your hope. Let's provoke one another to love and good deeds. We can't do this alone. This is something we have to do. And then 25 about meeting together and not giving up, which which was a verse I remember I saw occasionally on social media. Uh, some people were tossing around during the COVID lockdown saying, you should still meet as a church no matter what, even if you're going to get everybody else sick because Hebrews 10, 20, <laughs> really is a, is a gross misuse, a misunderstanding of Hebrews and, um, and, and a gross violation of public health standards. But uh, <laughs> so people have heard of this verse that might have come in a backwards way through, through the, the COVID crisis. But it's um, but for Hebrews, it's faith is all about this journey. And if we were if the year were longer, we'd go into chapter eleven and twelve, where you've got these heroes of faith who all are praised, yeah. yeah, because they persevered even though they never saw the full manifestation of the promise that they were yeah. given. Yeah, and that's to me that's. That's Christianity in a nutshell, right? It's a mm-hmm. waiting religion. It's a religion of incompleteness. It's a religion that always thinks there's a f- future that's better than what we're in now, which to some is pie in the sky or irresponsible. But I, I think Hebrews expresses that really well in the <laughs> in the grand picture of what this book's about, um, even if every verse along the way isn't as pleasant or crystal clear <laughs> as we might have hoped. But I don't know. Is that what you're getting at, Joy? 
that's exactly what I was getting at. And Ooh. and since you brought up chapter eleven, that that this the those who are lifted up in in you know what we call the hall of faith are not lifted up because of what they believed. Right. It's because yeah. of what they did. Yeah. And some of them, it's kind of like, like, why is Jephthah in there? But, you know, for the most part. <laughs> okay, right, right. <laughs> but, yeah, right on. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.